Okay, let's begin with introductions. Yeah, uh, let's begin with introductions. And hello, everyone. My name is Abhishek. I'll be a chair for this round. Preferred pronouns, he, them. They'll prefer if you refer to the panel as a collective. I'll now ask my panelists to introduce themselves in order to list it in tab. Hi, I'm Alexander. Um, uh, they, them. Yep. Hi, everyone. Ayodele Samuel here. Uh, he, him. Good luck. Hello, everyone. My name is Ren. My name is Ren. So I'm I'm the panelist for this round. Uh, my personal preferred pronouns are he, him, they, them, but I prefer if you refer to the panel as a whole. That's it. Good luck for the round. Sure, uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I now I now invite the teams to introduce themselves and state the speaker orders starting with side proposition. Maxwell first, he they. My speaking second, number five. Nick speaking third, he him please. And team up. Uh, hello, my name is Vinayak Menon. Um, pronouns are he, him. I'm going to be giving the one and the reply. Abby. Um, hi, I'm Abby. I'm the two. Hi, everyone. I'm Miles. Pronouns he, him. I'll be doing the three. It's on for some housekeeping before we begin. Please time yourself. Uh, okay, we have a volunteer here. So, volunteer also maintaining time. No notes beyond 8 15. B, uh, I heavily request all teams to take POI. They're highly encouraged. And please sit your PR preference before beginning your speech. That being said, I now invite Prime Minister. Am I am audible. When Neil Parrish, an MP in England, was exposed for watching pornography in the House of Commons a couple of months ago, he refused to resign and vowed to stay in Parliament. If it hadn't been for the existence of this policy, he would have remained in power for years upon years. Democracy without this policy is hypocrisy. Proud to propose. How does this work? We believe this is going to work the same way it does in the UK right now. A recall petition can be signed by constituents. If this petition meets a minimum significant threshold, probably around 20%, if figure we're willing to adjust, the election is held. The politician is allowed to stand again if they wish. And if they win this election, they're secure for a reasonable period of time so that the opposition party cannot game this system. To be clear, we will set this rate as we currently do in the United Kingdom. That is to say, we will achieve a good trade-off between stability and accountability. We're not going to replace them every single day, but we will give voters a reasonable chance to unite to push people out. When will these recalls take place? We think voters are reasonable people. It's unlikely going to be when politicians legitimately change their stance because of new situations. We think it's going to happen in two cases. One, when new relevant information comes out about politicians, maybe, for example, large scandals that large numbers of people in the constituency can unite against, but also when elected officials start putting their personal interests in front of everyone else, when they succumb to lobbying, instead of protecting the interests, for example, of fulfilling promises. I want to bring two arguments. First, principled claim as to why we need this, but thank you for democracy. Second of all, as to why politicians make better decisions. And my partner is going to explain to you why ultimately we hugely increase engagement in democracy, a way for us to win on its own. First, on democracy. There are principle, the first sub point here is that there are principled non utilitarian reasons why we have democracy in as many cases as possible for twofold. One, there's no inherently good political decision. All policies are based off subjective priorities, which means people should be able to pick a representative who aligns with those priorities. Opposition cannot win this debate by saying people might vote in these elections for bad or short term reasons because individuals are legitimate in choosing the reasons for which they vote. Second of all, Point. more broadly, no thank you, individuals are coerced by the state. In the short term and long run, we are at the whims of politicians. We cannot replace them for years and years. They can take our money, they can imprison us or conscript us. The consequence of this monopoly of power means that individuals have the right to the greatest possible input to the decisions of the state because the state has absolute power over us. That's important, greatest possible input. Second sub clash, when do we restrict democracy and why is this not one of those cases? Two things here. First of all, we restrict democracy when there's insufficient accessible information to the public. 
So for example, central banks, but that's not true here. We think there's likely going to be a large amount of local news coverage, given this represents a potential local political shift that is quite relevant. We also think there's going to be local campaigning, campaigning because like the ruling politician wants to win. So there's going to be available accessible information. The second reason why we might restrict democracy is when democracy is either completely practically impossible or when it is overwhelmingly likely to destroy the functioning of government. So this is why we don't have people vote on every single issue whenever they come up. This is why we don't have a general election every day so that might result in like a complete shift of overall policies which might destabilize the whole country. This is not true here for two reasons. One, there's a reasonably high burden to be fulfilled before an election is triggered. That is to say, you have to make a significant proportion of your electorate angry enough to get off the couch and petition for you to leave. Second of all, we aren't supporting a complete change and destabilization of the entire system. We aren't supporting throwing away taxes, foreign relations, criminal justice, and placing it overnight. We are supporting, in certain okay. extreme cases, changing individual components, so thank you, of the system. Next subclash. Why is there a active obligation to implement this policy, to let local constituents up update their preferences? One, the greatest priority of the politician should be towards their local constituent, because these were the people who elected them, not the party and not the rest of the country. Two, represent representation should take into account the possibility that information, priorities, or the behavior of politicians changes, because expression and representation is not a static concept. It's something they do for you differently every single day. This principle is the most important thing in the debate. Democracy comes before utilitarian outcomes. We don't let people above a certain IQ vote and no one else can vote. Even if that means everyone is helped. What we have proven here is that voters can make an informed, justified decision that does not actively cripple the functioning of government, which means we should give them this choice. Like if you want to raise one. Many policies are exceedingly unpopular in the short term, like COVID lockdowns, but have good results in the long term. Because of your first characteristics, where if it's too technical that you should have restrictions on democracies, why do you support the revoking okay. of politician rights on these issues? How on earth is there insufficient information here? The politician goes to people and says, this is bad in the short term, but by the way, it helps us in the long term. Like voters can understand that this is going to help them in the long term if you have a quarantine, right? Also, if people want to vote on short term decisions, if like I need money, I need a job in the short term, that's a legitimate reason to vote. Okay, second of all, why do politicians make fact better decisions? The problem with status quo is that increasingly politicians are failing to represent people and fulfill the promises they have made. First, the rise of populism means there's been a race to the bottom where both sides make extravagant promises that aren't kept so that they can gain the high ground. Second, throughout history, the Point. lobbying and influence of backdoor party negotiations gives politicians incentives to be unrepresentative. To be clear, the reason for this lack of accountability is the system of general elections, which ought must support for three reasons. One, the fact that once the general election is reached, so much time has passed since the relevant scandal or the bad decision. The media cycle is much shorter than the election cycle. And often individuals do have short attention spans, which means politicians can brush things under the rug. Second of all, during a general election, there's oh. often less attention, though, thank you, on individual candidates. There's a focus on national candidates because there's a perception it has higher states during a general election the white noise draws people's attention away from the merits of their particular candidate and towards the entire country finally in national elections often they're overshadowed by short-term recent events that consume huge amounts of media time look at how for example macron got a massive boost at the last election with his response to ukraine which dominated all the other scandals that might have happened before why do we massively solve this lack of accountability Politicians now have to worry that they will be voted out during the period. They can't ride on the back of their party. They can't rely on politicians on the, the memory not being entirely fresh. They can't rely on the information being poor. Therefore, we believe individuals have far better incentives. Why does the, finally, why does this change the way politicians act much for the better? First of all, they're far less likely to engage in the worst kinds of scandals and corruption. We change the mental calculus of politicians. On both sides, there are temptations to do bad things. Sex scandals, being involved with lobbying, taking dirty money. Now the risk of getting involved with a potential scandal becomes infinitely higher. If you accept some bad money or meet private donors in a dodgy way, on upside, your constituency might be annoyed in the, long, in the short run, but you know in the long run, you're exceedingly unlikely to be removed for the three reasons we gave you. But we think these scandals are absolutely crucial. They damage trust in politics, but they skew politics towards the richest people in the world. And we think ultimately that is enough for us to win. But additionally, 
We think politicians' promises become far better. The promises are far more likely to be re rooted in reality during campaigning, as opposed to policies that they might not put in. For example, a local MP will no longer attract voters simply by saying, oh, we're going to build all these schools, even when he knows he might not be able to do so. He might either make a more realistic promise or actually more aggressively try and get that promise fulfilled. This is crucial because it gives the voters a realistic view of what the politician will offer them. And if voters don't know what their politician is going to offer them, which they don't on upside, then ultimately democracy without the policy is hypocrisy. We're proud to propose. I'll send the speaker for the final remarks. I now invite the first speaker from side opposition. All right, um, am I perfectly audible? Awesome. And I prefer my POIs verbally, so please just unmute yourself. Unfortunately for them, the burden on side proposition was quite high. What they had to prove to you was not only that we needed representation and we needed democracy, they had to prove to you why we uniquely needed another election on top of the election that happens every four to six years and why existing mechanisms were deficient to allow the level of accountability to hold politicians accountable and prevent them from doing the worst kinds of abuses. I listened to their entire speech and I have no idea why current elections can't solve back for the same problems they talk about, the scandals, the political mismanagement. I think that politicians politicians want power and they want to retain their power. So there's no reasons why the normal election does not solve. They did not fulfill that burden, therefore they lose this round. I'm going to respond to my opponent's arguments and forward two substantive arguments. Before that, some clarifications. I want to note that even though elections do happen in four to six years, that two things are critical. Number one, that recall elections occur in times that are less than a normal election, so they take several months as opposed to the very long duration that occurs prior to an election. But I also want to note that in the interim between elections, there are checkbacks against elected officials. In the best case, this looks like midterm elections or provincial and state elections that restrict the executive power of major politicians. But secondly, in the worst case that corruption, black money, and scandals occurs, there were impeachment proceedings that occurred where the legislature or like certain lawyers could litigate against politicians and prevent them from doing these kind of high crimes. And finally, we felt like if politicians internally felt like the entire country was against them, there were more likely to resign, which is what Boris Johnson did and what Nixon did. So I want to note that even if there are elections in four to six years, there are internal mechanisms that exist that solve back for these kind of problems. Moving on to their material. The first thing that they gave us was a principle. They gave us two lines of analysis. First, they told you that things are subjective and therefore people need to have their interests being met. Again, people can already vote in normal elections and have their pre preferences being heard. Next, they tell you that like people are held at the whims of politicians and they can be uh, imprisoned and there's a monopoly over power. First of all, I argue that people have other forms of input that they can use, such as protests, petitions, and lobbying. So there are mechanisms for voters to leverage over the government. And second of all, we don't live in an autocratic country where there's no civil liberties, where executives and elected officials have absolute power over individuals. Next, they tell you that right, right now there has to be a high burden in order for their principle to occur. But in their framing, they don't give us a high burden. They tell you it's just 20% of the population that has to agree for a petition. So I'll explain why it's actually very easy for fringe and extremist groups to get small subsections of the population to rally around for these kind of recall elections. Next, they claim the next claim they give to you is about how they get better um, like, like uh, uh, policies, right? First of all, they tell you that there's white noise and there's distractions. I don't think there actually is white noise because pol politics is always a competition. So even if politicians want to distract people, there are opposing groups that remind the populace of the failures of the existing government. Competition solves back. Second of all, I would argue that, like, again, people are unlikely to do, do, do things like scandals and corruption insofar as they want to get reelected. First substantive then is how they actually get worse policy. The problem on their side of the house is that politicians will pass very flashy short-term policy in order to keep their approval ratings high instead of rallying for long-term gains. This is bad for two reasons. First of all, short-term policies tend to be very detrimental. They tend to look things like tax cuts or things like the demonetization policy that Modi passed in 2014. These have short-term gains. They're very flashy and people generally support them, but in the long-term, they tend to 
have much larger effects on the economy. Second, I want to note that the important ambitious policies like land redistri redistribution, like major levels of healthcare reform are unlikely to happen on their side of the house because politicians realize that they need short term popularity. They are not going to pu push for these long term gains that may not be successful in two years, but may be successful in four to six years. I think this is very critical because on our side of the house, we get long term policies being passed that occur within the four to six times wow. time, four to six time frame of an actual election. These end up getting neglected on their side of the house. Also, what happens on their side of the house is that politicians don't do things that are unpopular but incredibly important. As Miles points out to you, politicians are unlikely to do things like COVID-19 lockdowns that in the short term will cause people to lose their jobs, will restrict their movement and in their liberties, but in the long term will reduce things like COVID-19 and healthcare problems. I want to note that on their side of the House, recall elections are very likely because opposition groups are likely to call for a recall whenever things go down. So anything that anytime there's a downturn in popularity, anytime there's a dis in disadvantage, opposition groups are likely to seize on this opportunity and turn it against the incumbent. That's the reason why they push worse policies. Before I move on to my second substantive argument, I can take a point if there is one. Who are the better group to determine whether someone should be replaced? Your other friends in the party who have known you since college, or the people who truly voted you in in the first place? Okay, the people who still voted you in still matter because in four years you need to get reelected. Those people also matter because there's other forms of check back that exist. So for example, if I'm like a really crazy president, but I ended up losing my Senate and my house because I'm passing terrible policies, that still restricts my power. I want to note that like the other check backs, the check backs that we noted to you in our counter model still create positive incentives for people to do good things. Second, second substantive argument is how we get a worse campaigning process. I want to note that constant election cycles lead to worse, more radical candidates that are even worse than the current officials. The first layer is how we get worse electoral outcomes. In the status quo, there's a cyclical nature of elections, which ensures broad voter participation. So because of the way the media cycle works, people know that on November 4th or on January 1st, every four years, there's going to be an election. And there's a natural buildup that occurs. So people are very aware of when elections happen. The problem with recall elections is that they're very sudden and irregular, meaning that people people don't expect the election. That was bad for three main reasons. First of all, there's limited campaigning time and windows of elections. So people were less prepared to be ready to vote. They're probably less aware of the election itself. Second of all, there's less information about the candidates. There's less likely to be things like major debates and media coverage about every single uh, candidate that's running within the time frame of the recall election. So people are less informed when they go to the ballot box and vote for someone else. Finally, there's less voter mobilization. So there's less time to to do fundraising and galvanize resources so that low-income people and minorities are actually coming to the polls. This is problematic because what you got on their side of the house was a tyranny of the majority, where extremist or populist group force a recall election happening because they're interested enough to sign petitions and they come out to vote, while the majority of people do not come out to vote and the elections become far less representative. I want to note that representation is a critical tenet of democracy. It does not matter how many elections you have if those elections do not represent people's opinion. So this was a principal implication of the argument. So what kind of candidates do you get on their side of the house? You get very populist candidates that run on vague messages of tearing down the political establishment and tearing down this politician that is so elitist that is ruining your life. That is the type of candidates that you're going to get on, the, on their side of the house. Candidates that are, are much more populist and much more volatile. Second layer is how you get a neglection of policy on their side of the house. Because when you have these spontaneous recall elections happening, it's an incredible waste of time and resources where people like Gavin Newsom during the California a recall election had to spend months of time during the coronavirus pandemic going out and campaigning and doing rallies instead of focusing on critical legislation that could have helped people out. So there's a massive reduction in the time that people are able to spend when they have to worry about recalls. And it's not just during the election, it's before the election. They want to get ahead of the recall, so they're more likely to do things like campaign rallies. Additionally, this also causes parties to do things like change priorities. So rather than focusing on legislation, they think about winning the election. This was very problematic. It reduced the number of laws that are being passed, reforms that are being passed. So overall, they get a worse government and worse representation on their side of the house. Thank you. Hi, sorry to interrupt. Daniel, are you here? Can you hear me? Um, okay, um, Dan, who's Daniel? Okay, 
Okay, I can see that Daniel is in this room. That's what I wanted to check. Daniel, please, if you can hear me, check out the uh, the regular messages I sent you here in Zoom, and please move to the main session. Sorry about that. I'd ask both uh, judge both the coaches if I was able to observe, but I will do that. Sorry about that. It's okay. Thank you. Okay, I thank the speaker for the final remarks. I now invite the second speaker from side proposition. Hi, just checking everyone can hear me if I speak like this. Side opposition lays out a very specific burden that we need to meet to win this debate. They say we have to prove why we need this specific measure and why the status quo is insufficient to grant people full democracy. We answered both those questions pretty conclusively in first, but let me spell it out to you, Team USA. The fundamental problem with the democracies of today is that humans with an average attention span of eight seconds are only allowed to choose who represents them once every four or five years. That's why democracy without this policy is pure hypocrisy. And we're so proud to propose. I'm going to do a couple of things in this speech. First of all, some responses to their arguments and some rebuilding of the case they responded to completely insufficiently. And finally, a new point as flagged in first on political engagement and why that's so important. First of all, some areas of rebuttal and rebuilding. What we got out of side opposition was essentially a jumble of mitigation. So I'm going to be very clear in laying out why we believe we've already won this debate from the outset. Five areas here. First of all, on the principle. I think we laid this out pretty clearly. We explained why we need to have as much democracy as is feasible, why we only restrict it when we have insufficient information for people to make good decisions or when it's practically impossible for the running of government to do so. We explained why specifically we need it here. Maxwell tells you that it's because politicians have failed at the duty, they've failed at representing their constituents of what they're elected to do, and therefore we ought to prioritise this against whatever utilitarian metric side opposition implicitly supports. What's their response to this? They tell us, well, we already have elections and we don't live in authoritarian states, so people are allowed to protest and petition. Frankly, I think this is completely insufficient because the framing that Maxwell gives to you for this principle is very explicitly, we want to have as much democracy as is possible. That's why we want to have elections as frequently as possible. That's why we want people to be informed all year round instead of just election facts, because we think democracy is a good thing. And the more autonomy you can give people over their lives, the better decisions they're going to well, make, the better they're able to serve their own interests. No, thank you. So we explained to you why this principle is not just about having democracy in some shape or form, it's about having as much democracy as we possibly can. And therefore, their mitigatory responses about how we already have elections and we already have mechanisms to protect democracy were insufficient. We think we win that on this alone based on Maxwell's way of the principle. But second, they try to tell us that there are internal mechanisms that stop corruption. They say, first of all, we can have midterms, and second, we can have impeachments. Again, we think these are completely insufficient, because as Maxwell lays out to you, there are three clear reasons why we don't think these are sufficient. First, because often, by the time you reach one of these elections, a long time has passed since the relevant scandal or bad decision. Second, because there's less attention on individual candidates. And third, because in the short term, in the short -term national elections are often overshadowed by recent events. We'd like to point out that in the US, your own president wasn't convicted despite nominally being impeached. We think it's clear and should be very clear to you that these aren't always sufficient. I think people regularly don't show up to midterms. People aren't engaged enough for these internal mechanisms to be sufficient. But again, we bring you back to our principle because we weren't on this alone, because if you want to introduce another mechanism to have more democracy, unless you're going to prove to us why that's a bad idea, you can't win this debate. But then they try to tell us that what we get under our side is flashy short-term policy. I think this is a pretty generic argument that's not remotely specific to this motion, because note that here we're talking about like local members of parliament being recalled by their own constituents. It's unclear why my local MP, who hasn't been a member of the cabinet for about 10 years, is single-handedly capable of tanking the economy if he ends up recalled in a local election. But second line of response is that we're just not sure why people don't vote for long term policies well. I think side opposition has a pretty low estimation of the general population. I'd like to point out that people in the United Kingdom, where we already have the system, literally voted for a government that implemented lockdown, a short term harm with massive long term benefits. 
absurd opposition. I think people don't understand politics when it's explained to them. We think that's wrong. But thirdly, we just think these policies are managed by national government instead of local members of parliament. Therefore, it's far more likely that we're able to get that equally under our side. But then we're told that we're going to get bad campaigns because these politicians are going to be short termists and opposition parties are going to gain the system. A couple of responses here. First of all, it's just a complete assertion that these campaigns are going to be very short term. Just because the US has ridiculously long election cycles doesn't mean that's a norm in the rest of the world. But also, we're totally happy you can say you have a long time to educate people and for them to read the news. But second line of response here is that we think in these circumstances, you have far more emphasis on local news, and that occurs in the national news because it's seen as a reflection on the ruling party. So your specific constituency is covered in the national media. That means you have greater access to information than you would in a general election. But finally, as we pointed out during our stance, we have safeguards against opposition game system we have this one year period but also we think it looks bad for them politically if they're going to try to introduce another election if they end up failing and it looks like they're playing political games and their fifth argument here, their fifth fifth point here is that they say well oh, this is going to distract politicians from focusing on campaigns from focusing on actual politics they focus on their campaigns instead and that's about we don't think focusing on campaigns is necessarily a bad thing. Know that this is happening at a local level. So it probably doesn't look like putting your face on a bus or promising 350 million pounds for the NHS. This probably looks like going out and talking to your constituents and engaging in their priorities on what they want. We think, frankly, that's no bad thing. We think politicians should do more rather than less of that, more engaging with the local community. We think that's actually a point for our side. But finally, would you just suspend democracy in a situation where it could be potentially harmful? Would you say a pandemic, to use your own example, is a good reason to no longer have democracy. We think this is absolutely vital. Again, I remind you of the principles we brought in first. We got nothing but mitigation, no sufficient response. We think that brings us this debate out. But even if you don't believe that, a new point of extension on political engagement. Why do we think there is currently a lack of political engagement between election cycles? Four reasons. First, because people have other priorities. The vast majority of people aren't hugely politically engaged at the best of times. They have other priorities. They have lives, jobs, families. US voters could only just about motivate themselves to show up and vote out Donald Trump in 2020. This is an incredibly extreme case with huge effort around getting him out of office. We don't think this exists in the vast majority of cases. Second, many people hate the culture of corruption that exists under opposition. They're often actively disinterested in politics because they see these news stories of scandal and corruption day after day, and they're used to a 24-hour news cycle, so they have an incredibly short attention span, and even if they can vote their elected MP out in three years, that might as well be 30 to them. There's no feeling of community around politics, because you don't have the national media talking about the selection, you don't have friends, staff, and members or co-workers talking about it. Sure, I'll take that point. If voters have like an 80 second attention span, don't you think you increase voter apathy if you increase a vast number of elections and campaigning? No, we don't think so. Because what we're capable of doing is we are saying there is recourse in the short term. You don't have to wait three years and let this way on your mind. You don't have to remember it in three years time. The, the government is going to take action today and you are going to be able to vote this person out of office. That's why people with short attention spans under our side of the house are able to vote out corrupt politicians. Or you have no control, so frankly, it's useless to stay engaged anyway. It's honestly understandable if people don't care about politics between elections, because they have virtually no ability to change anything, even if a politician does something terrible. There's no logical reason to follow local news because you can't change anything. This is incredibly damaging, because in opposition world, you don't follow the news between election cycles because you feel so powerless. But under our side, individuals feel like they do have power to change the government, to change the person who represents them. So they read the news, they discuss with each other, and the media is more likely to focus on these things. The impact of this argument is that now people are able to make good political decisions, even if these recall elections are unsuccessful and corrupt politicians remain in office. Now people are far more informed. I think, frankly, that's an incredibly good thing. It means people can make better decisions for their lives, better decisions for their families. And for that reason, democracy without this policy is pure hypocrisy. We're so proud to propose. Thank you, Speaker, for the fine remarks. And now invite the second speaker from side opposition. Hello? 
Can everyone hear me? Thank you. Um, POIs audibly, please. So just unmute. Okay. More elections and more voting does not mean more democracy. Trump lost the election and Boris Johnson resigned. Accountability exists on ours to the House, and this policy only defeats the purpose of democracy by forcing politicians to focus on campaigning as opposed to really acting. For those reasons, we're proud to be on side opposition. In this speech, a number of things. Firstly, going through the two clashes of today's debate by, and proving to you why side opposition is far ahead before presenting a third substantive argument on why this increases instability in vulnerable regions. So first, let's talk about the principled clash and whether or not democracy truly requires this, quality, uh, this policy to pass. A number of things. First, I want to respond to their two reasons why this is principally just under a democracy. And one of the reasons why they cited this is because people have information. And if they have information in this election, then they should go on. But we have proven to in our case that people do not have information. And that means it is not a legitimate choice to make in this election. We told you that with crises, there are many technical problems that they do not understand. Their own example of that supports that. COVID is a great example of this too. I'm not sure why people understand the intricacies of medical technology and like pandemic response either, right? But secondly, I think you also decrease information on theirs to the House because there are far more elections, but also shorter election cycles. This means that news hour is not going to be on as long. People don't get as much information during the time being because it is a irregular election. So I think people will be unlikely to know as much about these specific issues that are being discussed because the election is coming up so soon, as opposed to every four years where there are literally two years of campaigning in between and things like that. But furthermore, you also decrease voter um, in participation and you increase apathy. We told you that with the increase of elections and people seeing that each election doesn't really matter that much because recalls are able to happen, people are far more unlike, uh, far more unlikely to show up. And given existing barriers for voter suppression and things like that, it only makes it far, far worse and makes people more unwilling. But secondly, I think during crisis situations, people are not able to act because in situations like COVID or if the country is going to war, people are far more susceptible to campaigning and rhetoric that is very harmful, like we told you. So the emotional vulnerability also takes an aspect. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there is a spectrum. There's going to be a degree of vulnerability at all times. But we think, especially with irregular elections, this is true. That is why this is not principally necessary. But second thing I'd like to note is that this argument is entirely hung, right? It doesn't matter if this is good for democracy on a principled level, if it truly erodes the democratic process and increases backsliding, like we said in our case. So they cannot win the debate on this alone. Even if we are marginally less democratic because we don't have as many elections, it's still far more important that politicians are actually doing their jobs and passing policy. That is the priority of today's debate. The second clash then on improving policy. So I want to first start up by uh, responding to the two arguments they brought up. First, they talk about corruption. I think this is roughly symmetric on both sides. No politician wants to be caught as a result of this. They have other interests such as re-election, but furthermore, nobody wants a bad legacy or to be known as a politician who is caught for corruption and doing bad things. And they probably need to find jobs after their election cycles, even if they don't look to get re-elected. They probably want to find jobs in government or in finance and things like that. And if their reputation is tarnished, that is not going to help. I think those interests are symmetric on both sides. Therefore, this argument is out of the debate. Secondly, let's talk about making smaller promises. Two responses to this. First, I think this only applies when there are scandals or very extreme things, right? In, the, in their examples, they talk about extreme scandals and they say that this is not going to be everyday occurrence. This means that nobody is going to try to dethrone a president or a leader just because they didn't build as many schools as they promised to do so. So I think this is not the correct scenario in this situation and it's unlikely going to stop them from making large promises since that backlash isn't going to happen. But secondly, I think you could probably increase that problem on your side of the house because when people are worried, people are scared, there is a recalled election, people are these alt-right groups and other fringe organizations who are trying to stay power or the opposition will likely take advantage of that bring up these big ideas and these big statements about how they're going to turn the country around and you only increase that problem on their side of the house. Information in this case decreases because they're focused on getting people out into the polls to vote and not actually why they should vote for them. They're probably going to capitalize off of things like fear and vulnerability. And this also increases apathy in this case because people do not know what is going on. There are so many elections. They have daily lives, jobs, priorities that take them away from this. Note that their speaker actually conceded it by saying that people are not very politically interested 
interested, which only feeds into our argument about lower voter turnout and lower representation. What did we tell you under this clash about improving policy? We crucially told you about why voter turnout is important and know that they cannot win on principle or practical of democracy if they decrease political engagement. We told you why information will be less quality because of these groups and what the type of slogans that will likely attract individuals and just because the time of the election is so much smaller in and of itself. So information cannot be disseminated in the large quantities over a large amount of time for people to be absorbing. But secondly, there are less resources from grassroots groups and things like that. And these elections are at the end of the day irregular, which means that people do not plan for these things and they often come out of nowhere. I think all of this leads to apathy when people don't understand politics. People don't think that elections or even general elections are important anymore because they'll just be a recall anyway. And it's a realm that they do not understand. This means less of a voter turnout and tyranny of the minority who originally signed the petition because the majority is disengaged, the majority is disillusioned. Given that policy gets much, much worse, I think we've proven to that and they have not responded to this argument in their second speech about voter turnout. Instead, they conceded it. But now in terms of policy, we told you about long-term policies that require short-term pains. That's not going to happen on your house. Also perfectly good politicians can be pushed out of office because opposition groups can construe Obama to be the culprit of the recession when in reality, it is decades of bad economic policy that led to that point that is not just, and I don't think people are able to make that choice if there are other forces of opposition's group convincing them otherwise. Given that I think we've successfully nullified their principle, proved to you why we increase democratic participation and why policy gets better. Given that then, there's a standard argument on instability. Wow. This argument is especially true with less developed economies with fragile and nascent democracies. This looks like Argentina, Brazil, Nigeria, et cetera. And what characterizes these countries? I think a lot of the times they are post-colonial. A lot of the times there's a big wealth disparities, ethnic tensions, a lot of extremism, and at the end of the day, weak institutions as well. All of these warrants and characterizations about developing states and nascent democracies makes all of the arguments on our the house far more likely and severe because they do not have the structures to check back against this. What this leads to is first, we get this revolving door, right? Let's assume that these recall elections do happen, presidents do bad things. This means instability and change in standards and policy and things like that. Secondly, it also probably looks like in a social instability because opposition groups often weaponize existing political and ethnic divides that exacerbate existing trends of violence and instability and things like that. What does this all mean for these countries though? First, it means less domestic and international investor confidence. This means that they're unlikely to go into to receive companies coming to their company or, or countries or any type of aid because no company wants to invest in countries and economies that are incredibly volatile. But secondly, you're also not going to get as much trade and global cooperation, which is crucial for these countries because changing administrations means different policy approaches and countries want to build ties with stable and trustworthy allies. You're not going to build ties with somebody and give them a lot of money if the next president that is coming along or they're going to get recalled is going to be entirely different and potentially even antagonize your own nation. All of this means less economic growth for these vulnerable people, fewer jobs and companies coming, and for these already struggling places. So given that, we've proven to you why we increase democracy, why policy gets better on our side, but why we most importantly also secure the economic growth for these countries that currently need it and don't have political stability. Proud to stand on side opposition. I thank the speaker for defined remarks. I now invite the government whip. Hi, uh, am I audible and visible? Cool, thank you very much. Uh, I'll take POIs verbally, please. Democracy is not just going to a ballot box once every five years. Democracy is the knowledge that your views are represented by those who you trust to make decisions for you. The belief that those who represent you have your interests at heart and will do the right thing. Now, Team USA don't believe that people are smart enough to understand the idea of a long-term, short-term trade-off. 
We think that is not only insulting, it is demonstrably false when they recognize that we are willing to give these people democracy in the first place. So panel, that's why Team England says democracy without this policy is hypocrisy. Three points of clash in this speech, firstly on the principle, secondly on political engagement, thirdly on accountability and who makes the best decisions. What did we tell you on our principle? We said that there, is our, that there are principled reasons to implement democracy in as many reasonable cases as possible. We said that there is inherently no good political decision and that individuals are coerced by the state's power, so ought to have a say over how that power is exerted. We told you that there are two criteria for where we restrict democracy under the status quo. That is, where there is insufficient accessible information and when it is practically impossible or destroys the functioning of, the functioning of government to do so. How do they engage with this? Because despite Maxwell delivering this point for four minutes, Prop 1 decides to tell, Op 1 decides to tell us that we only had two lines of analysis. Their first response is wholly mitigation. They say that other accountability exists, so therefore there is democracy. And I want to flag clearly here that this is not engaging with Maxwell's analysis on this principle, because we explained why we want more democracy, provided it fits with that criteria. But I'm going to go through the three alternatives that they give and explain why those are not enough. Firstly, the, the first one they give is midterm elections. Just to point out how midterm elections work, they are only for some representatives. Every representative serves a full term. That is how terms work. But secondly, to give you the example of impeachment, I think Maxwell already pointed out why having your college friends who you work alongside and who know you incredibly well, deciding whether or not you should stay in your job is obviously less democratic than putting it to the people who you're supposed to be representing. But then they tell us internal mechanisms. And this is why Boris Johnson resigned. Look, I really appreciate Team USA trying to use an English example, but to be clear, part of the reason Boris eventually resigned after refusing for so long was because there was an attempt to get a recall petition in his constituency of Uxbridge and South Reislip, and that would have been incredibly politically embarrassing for him. And recognize on this panel, that they concede here that people can be unrepresented for four to six years, uh, provided that these other mechanisms that their friends have decided that they're okay. We think that is not democratic. We think that is abhorrent. The second thing they say that they pivot to in their second off speech is that, well, during a crisis, you don't have enough information to make this decision. First of all, we just think this is simply untrue. We think during a crisis, there is likely to be access to more information. See, all of the information that was available during COVID. But crucially, if a crisis is bad enough to not have elections, I don't know if there's a nuclear war or something, then yeah, we'd probably be happy to have a temporary ban on recall elections and general elections because that meets the criteria that Maxwell set out. That is entirely consistent with what we told you, and this is not a response to our case. So let me weigh this principle for you then, because we told you that democracy is not about getting utilitarian benefits. It is about representing people's wishes, and we ought to maximize the amount of democracy that we have. That mitigation is never enough to engage with that. So we think we went on this principle alone and show why this is something that we ought to do. But let's talk about the practical side of this debate because it comes down to two clashes, political engagement and accountability. On political engagement, Maya gave you four clear reasons why there is a lack of engagement under the status quo and why when people are given a sense of power, when the media is incentivized to focus on these individuals, that engagement is improved. They give three claims which directly respond to this, all of which we think are wholly insufficient to take out Myers' compelling analysis. First of all, they say that people are less prepared for these elections because there is not time to be ready to vote and inform yourself. As we pointed out, and to which we got no rebuilding, I'm not sure why this is necessarily true. We are perfectly happy within this policy to give these elections the same amount of time as other elections. And note that we pointed out, panel, that the whole world is not the USA. Not everyone has crazy long two-year election cycles, and you should probably contend with that. But yeah. secondly, we think any lack of information is counteracted by the increased media attentions that these elections have compared to a national election. Because recognizing a national election, you have to share that information, that media coverage, between 650 constituencies, or to put it in American language, between the 50 states. And we think that makes it a lot harder to access the information that you need at a general election. Second, they tell us that opposition parties can gain this because extremist or populist groups can force a recall election and then they're the ones who vote on it. We were very clear in our model that we think this is something that is not feasible or likely to happen. Because if an extreme party is able to get 20% of your constituents to get up out of their room and sign a petition, we don't think they are that extreme or fringe in the first place. But secondly, we especially said in our model, this is only something that can happen once a year. So it's not like we're going to be having these every week in a sense that it is going to completely disrupt government. 
But second thing to note here is that elections are expensive. I don't know what kind of extremist populist group is able to fund having these recall elections on everyone as soon as they can all of the time. We just think this is unfeasible. But importantly, even if you accept that they are able to get away with having an election, we think there is still massive media attention that comes to that constituency when that by-election is called. We think that means that more people are likely to vote and you're not just going to have the extremists voting these people out without anyone else voting against them. That means then that their impacts, which are a sudden wave of populism, are clearly woefully underanalyzed and do not stand in this debate. The final thing they claim is voter apathy. They say that if you have a short attention span, you'll be annoyed if there are loads of elections. Let's be clear, panel, and this is similar to my response to the last thing, we do not concede this because this does not mean that people have to vote every few weeks or every few months. The majority of politicians will get through their term without a recall election. That's how it works in the US. That's how it works in the UK. So do not let opposition give you an unrealistic view of this happening in every constituency every week. That's not what's likely to happen. But let me flag this now, panel. This rebuttal also takes out their underanalyzed new argument in OFF2 about how this is going to have a massive lack of investment because there's political instability. And note, panel, that the UK and US, despite having recall elections, are not developing countries that lack investment because of their massive instability. They are incredibly prosperous. Once again, their claim is woefully underanalyzed and does not stand. So we win on their most important clash of engagement. Before I go on to accountability, I'll take what the hill. Voters are already feeling apathy because of the number of elections, the number of local elections. What happens if the increase in amount of campaigning, amount of polarizations, amount of sensationalization sure. is really cold? In a couple of constituencies, you have one more election per cycle. I do not think this is the tipping point that makes people stop engaging with politics. And in fact, when these elections happen, it's because the people wanted them. What do opposition tell us then on accountability? They say that politicians will not do policies which are unpopular. Three layers of response to this. Firstly, if they are doing something which is so unpopular and cannot be justified understandably to the electorate, we do not think that is something that they should do. We think it is legitimate to vote on your short-term interests if that is what matters to you. And they never engage with that part of Maxwell's principle. But secondly, the response to your constituents is not necessarily not to do that policy. It is to justify that policy to them so that they understand the short-term, long-term trade-off. Because we do think voters are able to understand this. They want long-term things as well as short-term things. And we think that is something that is incredibly valuable. Secondly, they say that candidates are going to be too focused on elections. Let's be clear on what this apparent harm actually looks like, right? Because what they mean is that candidates now have to wait for it, go to their constituencies and speak to their constituents, and they might even have to justify their decisions to them. We think that is unambiguously a good thing if they are focusing on the people that they are responsible to. Note what we told you then here. We told you there is a lack of accountability, that this policy is going to make politicians act better because we shift the decision-making calculus in their head and give them a massive added incentive not to do the terrible things they do under, under opposition side of the cows. Trust the people because democracy without this policy is hypocrisy. Proud to propose. I thank the speaker for the final remarks and I now invite the third speaker from side opposition. Hi, am I audible? Great, I'll be taking verbal POIs, please. Behind Teams England's very sophisticated accent lied a bunch of simple characterizations that made no sense when you compared them to each other. Proposition one said that they in the entire second sub is that people lack information and are susceptible to populist causes. Proposition two said that people have an 80 second attention span. Then proposition three tells you that people are able to evaluate long-term policies when politicians campaign for them. This made absolutely zero sense when you validate them in the whole of their strategy and the arguments in case. 
What we gave you was a more realistic, nuanced view of how voters and people work. We told you that there's very likely to be short-term incentives, right? You cared about the impacts that happened to you in the real world, how gas taxes were right now. That's why it tracks so closely with presidential approval ratings. We tell you that you're able to consume information, but to an extent, that there's a lot of voter apathy when there's over media attention, where there's too many campaigns. That's why people didn't even care about local races in the first place. And we also told you that overall, it is very hard to evaluate policies based off a theoretical, theoretical concept that they campaigned to you because you wanted to see the result of it in the long term. Whereas if you had recall elections and avenues to do so, then it meant you were voting necessarily based on insufficient analysis. This is all of the characterization we gave you that was a lot more realistic and underpinned every issue of this debate. That's why we won. Three things I'm going to talk about. One on the principle on why spending three or four minutes in the Proposition 3 wasn't a really good strategy. Number two, I'm going to talk about the quality of policy. Finally, I'm going to talk about voter turnout and polarization. On the principle, they told you that you wanted the greatest political input, and the two restrictions of this were for te very technical policies and if it destroyed the foundations of democracy itself. We told you a couple of things. We told you first that in terms of technical information, that this is likely going to be true because they gave you an example of the central bank. We told you people were unlikely able to evaluate the results of say like plunging your country into debt for a white elephant BRI project, i.e. in Malaysia. And it took actually seeing the results for people to better express their preferences. Thus, that's why we wanted four year election yeah. cycles. We told you destroy the foundations of democracies. If you let special interest groups, Proposition 3 says, I don't know how popular groups have so much money, precisely because of the fact because elites are able to exploit it the most when you have voter apathy and a lot of campaign periods. And the fact of the matter is if you get lower voter turnout, then you decrease representation. So this was hung on the practical. But most importantly, they never told you why this mattered. They told you, quote, democracy is not about utilitarian outcomes. The best analysis is probably in Proposition 3, in which they said, we want representations of people's uh, wishes. But again, this was a very simplistic analysis because you tell you we care about democracy because it's an aggregation of people's preferences. They never told you why it was an utilitarian outcome. We told you that people knew what best they want, but there are obviously some limitations we had to make. So if you get the best aggregation to people's preferences in the policies that result, you actually fulfill this far better. Two clashes there. One on the quality of policy, second on turnout. On the quality of policy, we gave you a very simple characterization that they never responded to. That many policies have a lot of long-term impacts that are very hard to evaluate. Why? Three reasons. One, there's a lot of external factors out of control, i.e. like how the gas and oil market is with prices. It's very hard to control domestically. Second, there's a lot of technical work with these policies. Even if it isn't in the central bank, there's a lot of very detailed economic analysis or like being people to understand about international relations that you necessarily had to see the results of to understand whether or not it was effective or not to make the best decisions from the people. Third, we told you just overall, even from a debater perspective, even from someone who is very expert, it's very hard to analyze policies based on it after a month of it being in place. We also told you then that you got a lot worse policies on their side. They talked to you about accountability and scandals. Number one, we told you that we would love to have impeachment in the court system. This isn't perfect, but it's a good incentive because if you want to try like high crimes or the sex scandals that they paint in Proposition 1, this was generally a good thing to work through. Second, we told you people remembered it if it actually mattered for them. They told you people have 80 second attention spans. We think this is a vast like gross exaggeration of what happens in elections because at the end of a four year campaigning period, opposition parties, the media brings this up. If voters truly cared about it, and they think it outweighed all of the other policies that politicians did, then we think it's great that they vote them out. So we tell you people do remember about this. What did this mean? We told, uh, Proposition 1 told you that voters lack information and you have populist uh, outcomes. We well, tell you then there's four reasons why you get worse policy outcomes on their side. Number one, you increase the incentives for very bad policies that may provide short-term war wars, but are hugely detrimental to the economy. Proposition told you that people can evaluate long-term policies. And the best version of this is that like the politicians are forced to justify them to the people through campaigning within their periods. There's a few reasons why this is wrong. Number one, People care far more about the impacts hitting them the most. This is because most people are not political junkies. They work a job, they have friends, they care about the impacts of society. We told you it's a lot better to evaluate the long-term impact of policy if you're still in a short-termist mindset 
If you're valuing the short-term impacts on you a year after a policy is passed, rather than the month after a policy is passed. This was the analysis that they didn't respond to. Second, we told you about media polarization. Cross-apply that analysis here, where even if you had politicians justifying the long-term impacts, you had the media focusing on the short-term impacts, like yeah. how Fox News is doing in the status quo. Meant then there's a countervailing narrative to that. Finally, we told you voter apathy meant they weren't going to focus on the information. What did this mean? It meant you were going to have huge impacts. It meant that you're going to focus on a large tax cuts for a short-term economic boost, but resulted in a lot worse economic detriment. It meant you were going to get go for that white elephant investment project that plunged your country into debt because you cared about not getting a recall in that particular election. You cared about getting the short-term incentives because you didn't want to go out for long-term ones that are actually good. Before I move on, I'd be happy to let Prop disagree. If you're smart enough to understand long-term trade-offs and you trust people to vote in general elections every five years where people are going to be discussing these long-term issues, why can they not vote in elections during the time of their choosing? We think people are more likely if they evaluate the short-term impacts, they would be able to better evaluate long-term impact of policies if it happened a year after policy was passed overall. That's an entire reason we gave you. If it was true that populist groups were able to, to like take advantage of short-term interests, it meant they could take advantage of all these recall elections. As Proposition 3 tells you, it's far more likely to happen when people have more money. That meant at least we're able to exploit it when there's voter apathy. The second thing to note here is that we're able to have impeachments, we're able to have long-term evaluations. They never explained to you why, given a concise summary within debates, within the media, after four years, why they couldn't validate the overall impact on their lives. We told you that when you have a recall election, the media imposes an insufficient information on them in order to vote against a particular uh, politician. So finally, I'm going to talk about voter turnout. Their analysis was extraordinarily simplistic. We told you that not everybody are like nerds in this debate room who love politics and are willing to do it for all the time. We told you once, one, that people were likely to be dissatisfied. They told you like at least voters feel like they have power over the elections. This doesn't make sense because again, as we told you, policies have long-term implications. So even if they vote in a new person, it's a long time to see that come into fruition. More than that, they are oftentimes dissatisfied with their opposing parties because of large promises. I.e. with Trump voted out because of the scandals, people are still dissatisfied with Biden. So they never had a sophisticated analysis that happened at the other end. Were they going to feel actually good about their power. All of this meant it was going to create voter apathy because we had a far better analysis. The fact of the matter is people were able to consume information to an extent. But what also meant is that after we reached that extent, people didn't want to become engaged in the political process overall. Let me tell you, their model was about one year of campaigning time. If a campaigning time for a normal election is one year, that means nearly half of the election time uh, of like an election period is with campaigning by the politicians. Meaning not only do you have less time to focus on policies, but you also have increased polarization because people want to take advantage of that. More than that, like the only analysis we got to our third argument was that, oh, the UK and the US don't have bad democracies. This is particularly about nascent democracies who needed stability right now, not in the long term. It meant even at their best ground, given no response from the proposition, that we got better stability, we got better investment, we got better economic accounts. For all these reasons, we're incredibly proud to stand in opposition. I thank the speaker for the five remarks. I now invite Rob Ripley. All right, am I still audible? Awesome. The thesis of side propositions entire case is that we should maximize input and we should maximize the number of voting and election. But our analysis down the line was this, that input did not matter if it was not representative. The only reason why we have democracy in place is for an aggregation of the voters' interests so that there's accountability that occurs and the wishes of the voters are represented in a government. And our argument was that recall elections did not accomplish this goal, that they were too short term, they were too irregular, and the actual wishes of the people would never be represented. That is why we won this debate.
I want to talk about two things. First of all, which side best protects democracy? And second of all, which side gets the best policy? I want to talk about which side best protects democracy. Because as the Proposition 3 tells you, the reason why democracy is important is about representation. We gave you three structural reasons down the line why they did not get participation and thus did not get representation on their side of the House. Number one, it was because people lacked information, that they did not get the coverage, the debates, and the discussions that normally happened within general elections. And I want to know from the beginning of the debate, we told you that these recall elections would be occurring in much less time, that the time it took for the governor election to happen in California was not the months and the weeks that the recall election happened to recall the governor. That was not our only analysis, though, because what Miles told you was very clear, that you could not evaluate policies in the short term, that within a matter of two years, you could not evaluate the impacts of massive policies like health care, like budget cuts, like land redistribution. These were policies that could only be evaluated within a four to six year time period. So trying to recall someone based on the implications of two years also fed into their burden about insufficient information. We gave you two other reasons that were also critical. Secondly, that you got less voter mobilization because you got less grassroots fundraising efforts, so less uh, low-income people would vote, would, would vote. And third of all, that we told you that these elections are very spontaneous and irregular. And as they tell you themselves, people have other opportunities and other things they care about in their life, so they wouldn't be as politically apt as we are right now, which means they were less likely to participate in elections. This outweighed their principle for two reasons. First of all, even if they got more elections, if turnout was less, representation did not matter. What they got on their side of the house was a very energized 20% that would prop up populist politicians and vote. But what they got was that the rest of the 80% was not as informed, was not as engaged, and therefore was not able to express their will. But that was just a short-term impact. They ignore the long-term outcome that Miles and Abby tells you, that if there's constantly recall elections that are happening, people feel that their vote matters less, that it does not matter matter if they vote in the mayoral election or the general election, because there's a risk that their candidate is going to get recalled, which means that in the long term, people are going to go vote a lot less, they were going to become far more apathetic. But the second thing I want to talk about is governance. And I don't think democracy actually matters if it does not serve the interests of the people. And that's why governance was so important. We gave you a bunch of analysis why, why like governance went down on their side of the house. First of all, it's because people focused on short term priorities. As England tells you themselves, people have an 80 second attention span, which means they weren't able to look into the long term. They looked into the short term, such as what was hitting their pockets, the gas prices, the inflation that was happening, which means that people were not able to make a rational decision about the long term implications of policies. Why did that change the incentives of politicians? Because they realized that the key was not to pass long term policies that could benefit people in six years. It was passing the quick task tax cut that could increase their approval rating. We told you short term policies were bad because in the long term, they would lead to detrimental effects. And second of all, that they would lead to a scrapping of the beneficial long-term structural policies that would improve government. The only analysis that they gave us is they get better scrutiny on their side of the house so that people don't do scandals and people are more receptive to the needs of the public. We still get that on our side of the house. As we told you from the second speech, there's always an incentive for people to not commit gross actions that are against the public interest. That if people lose popularity, that they'll lose the midterm elections, they'll lose their power, they'll lose their reelection which means politicians always have an incentive to pass beneficial policies. The difference on their side of the house is that those policies would be short term. For those reasons, we clearly take the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for the final remarks. I now invite the governor to conclude this debate. Everyone hear me? According to Team USA, implementing this policy leads to the collapse of the economy, the withdrawal of all foreign investment, widespread voter apathy, and a revolving door leading to chronic instability. For all their rhetoric, panel, about running a very nuanced and very believable case, I think this is unbelievably extreme. Maybe I'm missing something, but I do know politics in the UK isn't ideal right now, but I'm just not sure it's quite that bad. On side proposition, we tell you to trust the people. We tell you that democracy without this policy is hypocrisy. We're proud to propose. I'm gonna talk about two questions in this speech. First of all, which side is principally justified? And second, on the practical clash. 
First of all, on the principle, we brought this to in first. We gave you a principle claim from strengthening democracy, where we want as much democracy as we can, where this isn't a situation where it's justified to restrict democracy, why we need it here specifically. How does side opposition engage with this? Their first response is mitigation. We don't live in an authoritarian state, so we have general elections, we have midterms, we have impeachments, we can protest. This never engaged with the crux of our principle. Note that we gave clear mechanisms why these aren't sufficient to ensure that politicians that break promises or fail to meet the standards we expect of them in public life are removed from office. So let's go over those again, because we gave you three reasons at first, and they were never engaged with. First, we tell you often voters see that a long time has passed since the relevant scandal or bad decision that might impact the way they choose to vote. Second, because there's far less attention on individual candidates during national elections. And third, because national elections are generally overshadowed by recent events instead of focused on local politics. But even if you don't believe these clear responses that, by the way, they never engage with, our principle was never a simple assertion that democracy is good. Our principle was the state should be as democratic as possible, so even if you have plenty of other mechanisms protecting democracy, we should introduce as many more as we feasibly can to protect the health of our democratic systems. Then they say people are insufficiently informed to make these decisions, because there's very little media coverage surrounding these by-elections. At best of them, this is an assertion, and it's also just an actual lie. Neil Parrish's behaviour dominated, tracked upon intended, the news cycle for weeks afterwards because of the threatened recall election and potential disastrous consequences for the national government. We frame from first that these elections occur in contentious and controversial situations, situations that get lots of coverage. But even if people aren't as informed as they possibly could be, this is even more true for a general election, when no one scrutinises their representative because they only care about who wins a majority, and media coverage is split across the whole nation. So unless you just want to ban elections, we don't think this stands. But finally, they attempt to claim practical contingency, say, if democracy is harmed practically, we can't win on principle. I think they've misunderstood what democracy actually means, because it's about offering choice. We don't force people to vote, even if that would make democracy more representative, because we accept that choosing not to vote is a valid decision and itself an expression of a preference. If you don't want to sign this petition or vote, you don't have to, but that should never infringe on someone else's right to remove someone who doesn't represent them. And second on the practical, just to make a strategic observation, side opposition's characterization is not what the status quo looks like in the UK. These cases are rare, they get lots of media coverage, they don't happen every day, so that completely takes out that underanalyzed argument at second on chronic instability. But what do they tell us in this class? They say, first of all, that you get bad policies that are short term, it's not long term. We were very clear. First, that often it's fine to vote in the short term because that helps your interests. You need money in the short term because you've lost your job, that's fine. But second, that politicians have incentives to appeal to their voters. And note that their characterization that voters are stupid doesn't con when we rebut that, that doesn't contradict our analysis on why they have short attention spans. Attention spans are about forgetting, this is about whether people can understand trade-offs. But Finally, we think, frankly, even if you think these policies are bad, we support them democratically, we think you should as well, unless you want to ban general elections, land of the free, and all that. But second, they talk about voter apathy. This is a problem for their side because they never engage with our extension on why we get less voter apathy on our side. And then they tell us that you're going to get excessive focus on campaigning. We talk to you about how this isn't bad, how this actually brings greater accountability, greater engagement, why under our side of the house, politicians now have to campaign, they have to engage with their constituents, they have to do what they were elected to do. That's why democracy without this policy is hypocrisy. That's why we're so proud to propose. The speaker for the final remarks, I thank all debaters for what is an excellent debate. And now request the debater to cross out and shake hands virtually. In the meantime, please remain in your breakout room. Uh, the judges as well as myself